First, I'm extremely excited to be invited to present at the first ELPA Performance International Congress. My name is Dr. Scott Forbes. I'm a certified sport nutritionist, clinical exercise physiologist, high performance specialist, and an associate professor in the Department of Physical Education Studies at Brandon University in Canada. I've published extensively with regards to creatine, and I'm happy to discuss both the physical and the mental performance aspects of creatine in relation to basketball performance. So first, I'm going to talk about my conflicts of interest. I have none. The only conflict of interest that I have is that I love science. I trust science and I base my decisions on evidence. I have never received money from a supplement company and the supplement industry has no influence over my research. So creatine, it's a non-pharmacological amino acid compound found naturally in, in red meat and seafood. And when consumed in supplementation form has been shown to increase performance, muscle strength, endurance, power, and decrease inflammation and oxidative stress. Creatine was actually first extracted from meat in 1832, but it wasn't until the late or the early 1900s when creatine was used to enhance athletic performance. Since then, there's been hundreds and hundreds of research studies which, is, which have examined the effectiveness and safety of creatine supplementation. So what exactly is creatine? Creatine is formed in the liver and kidneys from three amino acids. Those are arginine, glycine, and methionine in a two-step process. You can also ingest creatine in your diet. And once it's in the bloodstream, about 95% of creatine is taken up by the muscle. And the remainder 5% is used in other tissues such as the brain. So once you get creatine within a cell, within the muscle or within the brain, about two thirds of creatine is converted into what's known as phosphocreatine. And the great thing about phosphocreatine is it can be broken down very quickly to replenish ATP. And ATP is the energy currency within the cell. In short, it supports high intensity exercise. So that's the great benefit of increasing the amount of phosphocreatine within the muscle. It, ex it supports high intensity explosive exercise. So as a sport nutritionist, I always recommend food first approaches. However, it's nearly impossible to achieve optimal levels of creatine with just food. So here's a couple examples here. So to get five grams of creatine, you would have to consume about 3.57 pounds of cod per day, nearly impossible. Or beef, 3.33 pounds of beef per day. Milk, about a, a 200 cups of milk per day, or 2.5 pounds of salmon per day. As such, this may be the only supplement whereby to optimally enhance muscle health, you have to buy a supplement. You can get sufficient protein from good food protein sources, whether it's plant-based or animal-based. You can get caffeine from coffee, but creatine is probably the only supplement where it's very difficult to get optimal or fully saturated muscle creatine stores with just food. So once you get this supplement, how do you get creatine into you and how do you actually um, consume creatine? There's two kind of dosing strategies. One is a involves a loading phase where you take a higher amount of creatine for a short period of time. In this loading phase, you would take 20 grams per day, 
usually separated into four packages. And you would do this for five to seven days. Then you would drop down to a maintenance phase where you would consume three to five grams per day. Or you can consume the low dose methods where you just consume three grams per day for 28 days. Both of those strategies will increase the amount of creatine within the muscle by about 20%. The low dose method will just take a little bit longer to get there. The other way to increase creatine uptake into the muscle is to combine creatine with a carbohydrate or protein source. So if you're consuming a protein supplement after your exercise, after your training session, just consume creatine with that protein, that's gonna increase the uptake of creatine within the muscle. So how does creatine actually work and how does it enhance muscle performance? Creatine works through several mechanisms beyond just increasing phosphocreatine. Creatine also increases the amount of glycogen that's taken up into the muscle. We know that before a basketball game, you might carboload or consume pasta, for example, before a big game. Well, if you consume that pasta with creatine, you actually get more glycogen or glucose or carbohydrates in the muscle. So you have a greater exercise capacity. But creatine works through other mechanisms as well. Creatine can reduce or block oxidative stress. And the way it does that is by helping to transport energy or ATP from the mitochondria to sites of utilization. Creatine also increases IGF-1, which is an anabolic hormone. And again, that can cause a cascade of events leading to bigger and stronger muscles. Creatine also increases myogenic regulatory factors. And here's a professor who has studied creatine extensively. His name is Dr. Phil Chilibeck. He's a Canadian professor, and he's showing some of these benefits of how creatine works. There's another great Canadian researcher. His name is Mark Tarnopolsky, and he's showing how creatine can interact within the muscle, particularly with these myogenic regulatory factors and how it's associated with water retention. So this was a snapshot of, of one of the quotes within this particular article. So it says, creatine monohydrate supplementation significantly upregulates mRNA content of genes and protein content of kinases involved in osmosensing. Essentially what this means is that when you take creatine, you get creatine within the muscle that's gonna suck a little bit of water into that muscle, but that's gonna actually signal a whole bunch of things within the muscle that lead to the muscle to actually grow. And so in layman's terms, what I tell people is that intracellular water retention signals the muscle to grow. Oftentimes I'll hear a common complaint with creatine is that if you take creatine, you just get watery muscles, but that water retention actually signals the muscle to grow. So that's an important component of creatine supplementation. And then creatine also inhibits myostatin or downregulates myostatin. And myostatin is a key regulate, regulator of muscle growth. If you Google search myostatin inhibition, you're gonna find a picture of this deficient cow. And this cow is obviously very muscular. So creatine doesn't have this effect. It just downregulates myostatin. It doesn't completely block it, but you can see the importance of that with regards to muscle development and muscle gains. So what does the research actually tell us? I would suggest 
if you're interested in creating supplementation and the science behind it, I would go to this position stand paper. And this was published by the International Society of Sport Nutrition. And it examines everything associated with creatine, the safety, the efficacy, and from an exercise, sport, and medicine perspective. And in this article, article they clearly show that creatine enhances muscle strength, muscle endurance, and muscular power. That is very well established and well known. We've conducted some of our own research, and this was in physically active younger individuals or younger adults. And we found that supplementing with creatine enhanced total body strength. That was the combination of an upper body strength, bench press test, and lower body strength, a leg press test, compared to placebo. So if you took creatine, you got stronger muscles. We also showed an increase in total body endurance as well. So not only do you get stronger muscles, but you also increase muscular endurance as well. We also know, and I've published a review article a couple of years ago now, so this was in 2019, where we looked at all the variables that can influence creatine supplementation. And this particular article was focused on older individuals that had sarcopenia, but these same concepts can be applied to several other populations as well, including younger individuals. So one particular study that I want to highlight was published by Dan Siratak and my former PhD supervisor, Dr. Gordon Bell. And they supplemented ind individuals with creatine and looked at responders and non-responders. So you can see on this particular slide that some people had big increases with regards to muscle creatine content. Some people had moderate increases and some people, it didn't seem like it had much of, a, of an effect at all. And they wanted to know why that was. And essentially they found two important variables that predicted if you would respond to creatine. The first was if you started supplementation with low levels of creatine in your muscles. So this may provide evidence why vegetarians and vegans may actually respond more favorably to creatine supplementation. The second factor is your fiber types. So we have two main classifications of fiber types, type one and type two. Type two muscle fibers are those fibers that are really important for sprinting and explosive type activities, running up and down the court, sprinting extremely fast to get the ball, for example, you would recruit these type two fibers. And so individuals that have more type two fibers responded better to creatine supplementation. So another common question that I get is, does it matter when you take creatine? So in 2006, Paul Cribb examined the timing of a, cre of a creatine containing supplement on strength and muscle changes when performing a resistance training program. So participants were randomized to two groups. One group consumed the supplement more than five hours before and after the training session. And the second group consumed the supplement just immediately before and immediately after training. They trained for 10 weeks and they looked at how big their muscles got and how strong their muscles got. So here you can see that the group that received the creatine containing supplement immediately before and after, so that's the white bars pre post, they actually got bigger muscles. So this is lean body mass or LBM and reduce their percent body fat to a greater extent compared to individuals that consume the supplement in the morning and the evening. But what about consuming creatine just before or after training? Does that make a difference? We've recently conducted a within subject design. 
So this type of design is, is really powerful and controls for differences between individuals that may influence muscle adaptations, such as protein intake, genetics, sleep. And we measured their baseline muscle size with an ultrasound and maximum strength. We did this for left and right limbs, elbow flexors, and uh, leg extensors, your quadriceps. Participants performed training on one side of their body on one day and the other side on the next day. Each side was trained twice a week for eight weeks and one side of their body received creatine before training and the other side of their body received creatine after training. And what we found was no difference with regards to gains in muscle thickness or muscle size. So whether you took creatine before training or after training had no effect on the results. Similarly, when we looked at muscle strength, again, whether you took creatine before training or after training had very similar results. So we suggest based off the evidence that consuming creatine in close proximity to your training is the most effective but whether you consume it before training or after training makes no difference. And we've also shown that if you consume creatine during training, it's also an effective and viable strategy. So we know creatine can influence muscle. And as I mentioned previously, there's, it's well established that creatine influences muscle performance. But there's an emerging area in the creatine world, and that's creatine supplementation for brain health. And there's an outstanding review that was recently published uh, by Hamilton, Bruno, Sergey, and Eric Rawson, which discusses all the nuances with regards to creatine supplementation and brain health. So in another nice review that was conducted by Eric Rawson and colleagues, he summarizes all the data. And based on the available literature, 12 studies, it shows that creatine can increase brain creatine levels. And this is about five to 10%. So compared to the muscle where you get about 20% increase with regards to um, total creatine content within the muscle, it doesn't seem to be as robust in the brain. And it seems to be a lot more variable. And so there's been a few studies that have looked at, does creatine impact cognitive processing? And so there's a variety of, of different studies here that have measured a whole bunch of different cognitive domains, things like memory, processing speed, executive function that's like decision-making ability, intelligence, and attention. And so I put either smiley faces if there was a positive of effect of creatine or a neutral face if there was no effect. And if we look at memory, three out of the five studies showed a positive effect with regards to creatine supplementation. For processing speed in healthy adults, it didn't seem to improve that cognitive domain. Executive function, one study showed a benefit, one study showed no effect. Intelligence, three out of three studies showed a positive effect. And attention, two out of two studies showed a positive effect. One important finding that you can see is that no study actually showed a detriment to creatine supplementation. So it either had a positive effect or no effect on enhancing cognition. And this was in healthy adults. We've also examined some of the benefits of creatine supplementation on brain function, particularly when the brain is stressed. And there's a couple ways that we stress the brain in the scientific literature. One is through sleep deprivation. We know if you don't get enough sleep, that can impact your cognitive processing. Another way is with hypoxia or a low amount of oxygen. 
And a third way that we've stressed the brain in science is with mental fatigue. Again, those are all methods to induce a decrease in cognitive function. And so here's a study in athletes where they had them sleep deprived. So they only got three to five hours of sleep and they measured a performance task. And in this particular study, they measured rugby passing accuracy, which would be highly relevant for basketball players. And what they found was when they were sleep deprived, their passing accuracy went down, which is supported by extensive amounts of literature showing the benefits of sleep. But interestingly, if you took creatine and they looked at two different doses, 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight or 100 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And if you took creatine, that sleep, even if you were sleep deprived, your passing accuracy did not go down. So over the short term, there seems to be some evidence that creatine can influence your brain and influence motor performance, even in a sleep deprived state. And we know that sleep is extremely important. So we know that impaired sleep can have large decrements on performance. And we also know that sleep extension can actually improve basketball performance. So this is a study done in collegiate basketball players. And they found that extending their sleep from about six and a half hours a night to just over eight hours a night can actually improve sprint times. It can improve reaction time. It can improve free throw shooting accuracy and also three point accuracy as well. Sleep is probably the easiest, cheapest, and most underappreciated method to actually enhance basketball performance or any sport performance. We've also conducted studies in Muay Thai athletes or combat athletes. And we've actually shown that if you took creatine, just a low dose, so that three grams per day for 28 days, can actually influence visual reaction time. Again, this could be important in an athletic or a sport situation. So is creatine safe? We've recently, de de uh, we've recently looked at all the misconceptions and myths associated with creatine supplementation. And we looked at what does the evidence actually say? And in this particular article, we show that creatine is one of the safest supplements that you could possibly take. And if you don't trust me and my, my colleagues, you should trust the International Olympic Committee, which included the medical commissioner as well. And they stated that there is no negative effects of creatine supplementation, even up to four years when you perform appropriate loading protocols. So creatine is extremely safe. So just a couple key take home points from this presentation. Creatine is an effective supplement to enhance muscle performance. You can increase muscle size or muscle mass. You can increase strength and you increase power. And there's emerging data to show that creatine has the potential to improve cognitive performance. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.